Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Um, today I would like to tell you about the theorem, the so-called universal coefficient theorem, which is strictly speaking not, not part of algebraic topology, it applies in algebraic topology, that's why I'm talking about it, but actually it's a theorem in algebra, homological algebra, categorical algebra, whatever you want to call it. And it's kind of saying uh, why the integers rock. Of course, the integers are great, the integers are really one of my favorite numbers. Of course they are, the natural numbers are even better, but the integers are still pretty cool. Um, and this theorem is another justification why they are so cool. So let's have a look actually what this is all about. So um, remember that we had this notion of chain complexes and homology and whatever. And the point is, let's say you have singular homology and singular homology should be, uh, so here singular homology, singular homology should be, um, an invariant of a certain topological space. So certainly it should have a topological space as an input. Turns out that there's also the underlying type of numbers. So you have an underlying ring where you're working because this main idea in singular homology or simplicial homology, whatever you want, is to take certain linear combinations of cycles, right? So you have linear combinations. So you have a certain um, underlying type of numbers here. So it's not just you have a topological space as an input, but also a number system, if you want to. So here are some examples, how those things look like. We'll go back to these examples um, throughout this video. So you can have a, a chain complex of the integers, for example, where in each uh, step you see the integers or over the rational numbers, where in each step you see the rational numbers or over Z mod two, for example, where in each step you see Z mod two. And um, the homology you get depends on the input not just of the input of uh, the topological space, because this is a fixed topological space, we'll come back to that in a second, but also of the input of uh, the underlying ring. And this universal coefficient theorem should explain us, or there should be a theorem saying, hmm, okay, if I vary my ring, um, how does the homology change? And that's exactly what this universal coefficients theorem is all about. And in the end, it will say that the integers are the universal coefficients. We will see what that means actually. But this is the main idea, right? Um, not very, you, we, have, we can vary our number system. Um, so how does homology change if we vary our number system? Okay, so um, this chain complex here is actually the chain complex of the infinite projective plane, real projective plane. Um, so you have, it, it's very easy constructed as a CW complex. You have a cell in each dimension and they're glued together by a Z mod two map. That's basically what it is. And the chain complex looks like this, uh, or like this, or like this, depending on your underlying number field. And the way I do this here is I vary the number field as follows. I start with the, with the integral one, and I extend scalars. And um, so change of scalars, and the way to do this abstractly is by taking the tensor product. So I can either take the tensor product of a Q, for example, or Z mod 2, and I get, well, the corresponding sequences. Not much changes here for the chain groups. So instead of Z, I write Q, or instead of Z, I write Z mod two. But the crucial thing here is that the maps will change. So let's have a look what what this means. Um, so the, the integers. So it's just kind of the blueprint example of a ring. So the integers always have a map to any ring, just by sending one to one, um, and then n to one added n times, right? So you can interpret integers actually in your favorite ring. They might mean something different, but you can at least interpret integers in your favorite ring. So you can just take the integer to integral complex and interpret it for like, for example, over the rational numbers or over Z mod two. And the crucial change here is, okay, the so map zero is just a map zero, but for example, the map times two um, behaves pretty differently in your ring. So the element two makes sense in any ring it's just one plus one in that ring, right? So it's my map from Z to R, just one plus one. But for example, in Z mod two, the element two is actually zero. While in Q, the element two is invertible because I have, of course, the inverse, which is one over two, um, which doesn't exist integrally, of course. There's no inverse. And as I said, here's inverse is a zero, right? So you can kind of, if you vary your coefficients, what really happens here is that your maps get really different behaviors. So um, numbers in could be, if you interpret them in your appropriate, your, your favorite ring, they could, for example, get invertible or they become zero, right? So kind of 
very different and extremely different uh, situations. Okay, so and the universal coefficient theorem is a kind of capture um, the discrepancy between numbers getting zero and numbers getting invertible. Just to just to get the notation straight here, um, whenever I write uh, c x comma r, so x is some space. In this example, it was infinite projected plane as infinite projected space, happy infinity. Then this is just a chain complex tendered with the corresponding ring. And as I said, the crucial difference is um, really that maps change their behavior in different ways, which is really, really crucial. In the end, you will get completely different homology. It's kind of fun. Um, so what you can do here now is, okay, you can just say, okay, my homology with coefficients, so x comma r, is just a homology of that chain complex. So it is just a homology of this beast here, for example, for zero two order, or of this beast for q. And if I drop the um, the comma z, so this is comma z, but nobody writes it anymore. So um, yeah, so z is kind of the universal coefficient that we will see. Anyway, um, so there are two ways now to go to change coefficients. You can just do what I just said. You take the co chain complex, you extend scalars to um, to the integers, and then you just look at the homology, or you could naively, if you want, change the coefficients by just tensoring the homology. Uh, so you just, homology is again, just a Z module uh, and a building group. So you can just reinterpret the Z module by uh, over your favorite group. And the um, universal coefficients theorem measures the difference between the two. Why is it crucial? Well, because this one is super easy to write down. So this is easy. If you know, um, if you know the integral one, and the other one is the one we really want. So we want this one. Um, so because this one takes into account all these subtle differences between numbers getting invertible or getting zero. So you kind of want a relationship between the easy one, the one you calculate, and the uh, one you really want. And uh, the um, the universal coefficient theorem does exactly that. It tells you how those two are related. And in order to illustrate that this is not completely trivial, I decided to calculate the homology in those three cases here. Um, and it looks like this. So integrally, that's what you get. So uh, it's z mod two if n is, so let's ignore the n equals zero case. So it's z mod two if n is odd and it's zero. Otherwise, um, the one over q completely dies. So except for n equals zero, it's zero. And it does, in this case, it doesn't matter whether you uh, first tensor and then take homology or whether you take homology and then tensor. It's the same. Over z mod two is different. And that's kind of the point. It kind of, this universal coefficient theorem should tell you what's the difference. So if I first uh, tensor and then take homology, I get z mod two everywhere. And if I, uh, first take homology and then tensor, I get this even odd behavior again. So it's a bit subtle here what happens, um, depending on whether you first tensor, then take homology, is that the right one, that's the one you want, or you first take homology and you then tensor. That's the easy one, that's the one you usually compute in one line. Okay, and the universal coefficient theorem tells you that they're roughly the same. So don't look too much here, uh, I will come back to the tour, to tour in a second, but basically it says they're roughly the same, so the easy one, this one misses a little bit and the, the little bit is captured by this, this Tor functor, um, which I'm going to explain on the next slide in a second. For now, it's just some abelian group um, and you can just, it, it, the, the, the one you want is, is always a little bit bigger than the other one. Uh, so this, this is, so the statement is there's an exact sequence. And of course this works for homology, this works with more generality and whatever, it's actually a statement in algebra. It holds for any reasonable chain complex. But the takeaway message here is that uh, Z is really the universal coefficient group. So if you know it over Z, so this would be this one and this one, you just kind of extend your scalars and you, you know it over, over, your, over your favorite ring R by just, um, by just using this theorem. Um, one slight, really slightly, uh, difficult to remember point here is that you take tor of the group before. And of course, for cohomology, everything will turn around and tor will become what is called x, whatever, it doesn't matter so much. It's some, some way to measure um, this failure of uh, the homologies being the same. 
right? So the, the one you want is always a bit bigger than the one you naively get. And you, you can actually see this in those examples. The one you want, so in this example, it's the same. I will explain that in a second why this is. And here, the one you want is always a little bit bigger because um, it all also has Z mod two in the else case, right? Not just in the in the auto case. So it's always a little bit bigger. Anyway, I haven't really explained the store functor and I don't really want to. So in some sense, um, it, it measures how far uh, the tensor product is far is uh, away from being exact. So the problem is if you have a short exact sequence like this one and you tensor it, so you tensor with A, so uh, you don't get an exact sequence. You, you need to have a kind of a correction term given by the Tor function. Doesn't matter so much. I claim it's totally fine to know kind of the computation rules for Tor. So um, in some sense, this is the following idea. Um, so there's a definition of an integral whatever, Riemann integration or whatever, but you basically don't use that ever in practice. It's good to know and you should know it, but uh, really what you need to know are the computation rules for, for integrals. That's what you really need to know in the end uh, if it comes down to kind of practically computing those. Um, to define Tor is a bit tricky. So links of course to everything is in the description. So I don't want to do that right now. Uh, and I also claim that it doesn't matter so much in the end, as, as long as you get the, the right, um, well, the right computation rules that you want. And it's not so bad. So it's a kind of, it doesn't matter, it's commutative. It doesn't matter uh, whether you have input first or second, that you can change them freely. You could pull out direct sums. And this one is pretty pretty important. So it's, it's, it's very often it's trivial. For example, for Q it's trivial. So if, if for Q this tor term dies, it always dies. Um, so if for Q this term dies, then the naive one and the one you want are always the same. And this was exactly what this calculation also gave us. So the universal coefficient theorem works. It's of course a generalization of the calculation from before. So it's very often trivial. And the only other thing you kind of need to remember is what it does to Z mod N and to Z mod N, uh, for example, uh, you have this one. So um, torsion, it, it measures the torsion. That's, that's hence the name, the torsion that you have. Anyway, so let me wrap up the universal coefficient theorem. It tells you that you should work integrally because if you just go to your favorite field, you miss a little bit. You miss this little piece given by the, by the Tor function. And the, the universal coefficient theorem tells you exactly what you miss if you do that. So it working integrally rocks. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you uh, like the integers as much as I do. And I also hope to see you next time.